самые низкие показатели заболеваемости с сентября. Ограничения начнут снимать уже завтра. Сейчас мне уже 91 год. Ну, я чувствую сейчас то, что у нас есть сейчас Лукашенко, вот вокруг Лукашенко. Вот. И он, смотрите, 94 -го года ведет. Новыми антирекордами. Вот. Считайте, 16 лет, да? Сам себе. Думаю, мамоньки мои, 26 лет. Планеты мы в эфире телеканала Беларусь 1 и Беларусь 2. Когда Лукашенко говорит. Так сразу и глаза открываются, и даже, может быть, и рот открывается от э, такого интересного разговора, э, хорошего. А вы не думаете, что он действует как диктатор? Ну, диктатор, диктатор. Ну, это, это надо разбираться, вникать. А до, до телевизора и вот, до меня такого ничего не доходило что Лукашенко плохой. Только, только можно он делает мощные вещи. Вещи, вещи, вещи делает. И Лукашенко идет по правдивой программе. Мне кажется, демократ. Мне кажется, демократ, потому что он... Вот и все. Держит большую дружбу с Владимиром Путиным. Они держатся друг за друга. frightening thought that in a European country, in the 21st century, you have one man in power for more than two decades. And that's exactly what happened in Russia. Lukashenko had a six-year head start on Putin. He came to power in 94, Putin at the end of 99. By the time that Putin came to power, Lukashenko had already essentially established a full-fledged authoritarian system in Belarus and began doing many of the same things that Lukashenko had already done. You know, imprisoning opponents, shutting down independent media outlets, rigging elections, murdering political opponents with time. Boris Nemtsov called this the Lukashization of Russia. Путин воспринимается многими российскими избирателями как сильный президент. Он поднимает Россию с колен, он дает отпор вражеским проискам, он не имеет никаких равных ему альтернативных лидеров, и поэтому мы его поддерживаем. Нам просто ничего не остается, кроме как его поддерживать. Примерно в таких рамках находится мышление, ну, как минимум, 60% моих соотечественников. И это все результаты путинских усилий. Другой вопрос, что его сторонники не хотят всего это видеть, потому что у них состояние отчаяния. Если, если не Путин, то кто? is also a textbook example of how to transform a democracy to a perfect and solid authoritarian system. Didn't happen with a coup d'etat, didn't happen with a you know, military event, didn't happen with tanks on the streets. It happened gradually. It happened over time. It happened incrementally. As Mussolini once said, you should pluck the chicken feather by feather to lessen the squawking. That's exactly how Putin went about it. An autocrat is someone who rules by non-democratic means. Anyone who is authoritarian in style of rule. 
There are many countries in the world now that have been going through this process of gradual descent from democracy to autocracy. And then you look at the authoritarian regimes, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Russia, some of the other former Soviet states, and of course China most of all. And these regimes are even more authoritarian now than they were five or ten years ago. On the fourth day of his inauguration as president in May of 2000, uh, Vladimir Putin sent uh, armed operatives from the tax police and the prosecutor general service to raid the offices of Russia's largest private independent media hall. This afternoon, they tried to bring in reinforcements to the encampment already surrounding the television tower. 2003, we had a parliamentary election. You know, it's not difficult to win an election when your opponents are not on the ballot. При этом мы не остановимся на достигнутом. Мы будем укреплять многопартийную систему. Я думаю, что это может быть воспринято как агитация дополнительная, поэтому я воздержусь. Хотя мои предпочтения, я думаю, известны. Все доброго. They still go through the charade, through the sort of technical exercise, as do all dictators everywhere. Путин наиболее из всех предлагаемых кандидатов наиболее ответственный, наиболее подготовлен и наиболее продвинутый человек для того, чтобы вести Россию вперед. They have done everything they could sort of to try to guard against, to beef up the security services, to make mass arrests, to threaten, in many cases, to murder political opponents. Putin is a very insecure political leader, and he clearly fears that if he has a serious opposition candidate who is able to speak and travel around the country and mobilize, that things may get out of control in Russia, which is the land of monopoly power and monopoly greed, and a state that is capable of being murderous when it needs to be. On the night of February 27th, 2015, Boris Nemtsov, who was the most prominent opponent of Vladimir Putin, was gunned down by five bullets in the back literally in the shadow of the Kremlin, in Moscow. And Boris Nemtsov was not just a close colleague, he was a very close friend. He was someone to whom I owe everything I've ever accomplished in my political life. It's, and it says a lot about today's Russia, that this is the price of freedom that you have to pay the ultimate price. I was targeted on two occasions, uh, both times in Moscow, both times through uh, sophisticated uh, poisonings, uh, presumably carried out by chemical agents, a tool used by the security services going back to Soviet times, but this method has especially proliferated under Vladimir Putin. Both times I was in a coma on artificial life support and doctors had told my wife that I had about a 5% chance to live. For many people in my generation uh, in Russia, uh, it was sort of inevitable to become really politicized. This did perhaps mark the beginning of the end. The first conscious political memory was the Democratic Revolution in August of 1991, the three days that ended the Soviet regime, as we woke up that morning in August of 1991. Tens of thousands gathered in the central Russian Moscow. citizens, Muscovites, who refused to accept that coup d'etat, were not armed with anything uh, except their dignity and their determination to defend their freedom. And they went into the streets and literally yeah, stood in front of the tanks. And then the tanks stopped the and turned away. This was my first conscious political memory. I was 10 years old at the time. Enthusiastic, roaring approval for every fresh announcement. The biggest fear of any autocrat is his or her own people. It has been 
like this throughout history. Nothing changes in this regard. It was the only moment of reflection. You know, no foreign invasion, no uh, sort of pressure from outside is as dangerous to them uh, as when they see crowds of people on the streets. On Vladimir Putin's watch, there have been many democratic peaceful revolutions, but none of them so far have been as dangerous for Vladimir Putin as the one in Ukraine. Russia now is the most aggressive enemy of democracy in the world. The strategy of Kremlin is to build a Russian world. And it's not only about the money, it's not only about corruption, it's about the culture. They want to, everyone to fear them. Kremlin wants to control some part of this world for their purposes. They think like empire. And Ukraine is already a democracy, biggest Russian-speaking democracy, unfortunately to them, of course. of dignity in Ukraine was a moment when Ukrainians choose not to fear. что Путин проиграл Украину, которая уходит на юг, он привел страну в международную изоляцию, его уже не воспринимают как ровню на Западе, он уничтожил или проиграл важнейшие политические институты. И в этом смысле Путин президент прошлого. Why Ukraine is so important for Kremlin, and it means that it's very important for the world, for all this battle for democracy. Geographically, Ukraine is, was actually, in the middle of this conflict, between the worlds, between the liberal world, liberal democratic world, and authoritarian world. Every year we become stronger. But Kremlin do its best, put all its resources, we to fail. Because it's impossible to build a Russian authoritarian world without Ukraine. Coming into land, Reinforcements for a unit of Ukrainian troops. Ukraine already involved in the war, and it's not only a conflict between Ukraine and Russia. Ukrainian people is not our enemy. And the Russians? Maybe. I believe that it's a war against democracy. It's not a crisis. It's a handmade situation. If we will lose it, uh, it will be a loss for all the world. When they're at war politically with your values, principles and institutions, you either have to decide that you're going to defend them and fight back or uh, we are going to be at very, very grave risk.
As I sit here, Russia is massing troops on the Ukrainian border. As I sit here, Russia is mobilizing new military power in the Arctic Ocean and so on. China is mobilizing its military in the South China Sea and bearing down uh, on Taiwan. I don't think we should seek a Cold War, but it is a period, a new period of normative battle over democratic values in the world. And I think democracies of the world have to recognize this and rise to the challenge. Figuring out how to deal with the rise of China is the great challenge of the 21st century. It has gotten more authoritarian over the past decade. They champion an alternative to Western democratic capitalism. That gives dictatorships like China's an incredible vulnerability. Should a day come when that regime is no longer able to provide economic growth, it will no longer have any reason to stay in power. And the only choice it will have, therefore, if it wants to stay in power, is to use increasing repression and increasing violence against its own citizens. So in 2014, I was a student leader. We had the massive uh, civil disobedience movement called uh, the Umbrella Movement. By then, Hong Kong people were promised democracy and autonomy by the Chinese government. We didn't believe them after the Tiananmen Massacre and under the one-party dictatorship. And so we have hundreds of thousands of people blocking the major runway of Hong Kong, showing a very strong signal that uh, we are demanding for democracy and the government should listen to our voice. Okay. They saw us as troublemakers or even like traders of the country because we demand a democratic system in Hong Kong. So we actually suffered a lot of um, adversities and attacks. We decided to run for election. I managed to, um, to win the election at the age of 23 and becoming the youngest ever elected legislator in Hong Kong's history. It, it shows how Hong Kong people wanted to change. But at the end of the day, the government they always can find ways to suppress you. They managed to kick me out of the council nine months after I represent the people in it. A month after um, I went to jail, um, called uh, the Umbrella Movement, I felt definitely bad about it, but um, I actually had a mental preparation for that. And I feel like it's actually one of the pit stop in our activism journey. At the end of the day, um, the movement did not succeed, but it was a, a very memorable page of Hong Kong's history because it reflects uh, the very first massive disobedience movement of our time. I decided to flee out of the city in order to preserve a voice. And soon after I left the city, I found myself on the wanted list of the national security law. If I were to be back to Hong Kong, I would immediately be arrested and be submitted to the national security court. The charges they put on me, um, the maximum penalty of it is life imprisonment. Um, 
we are literally facing the most powerful authoritarian regime in the world. So we are actually facing uh, David versus Goliath battle. If everyone who wants to change their country only thought about their personal safety, then nothing in history would ever move forward. We know the risks and we accept them because we think our country deserves so much better than you know, being ruled in the 21st century by a kleptocratic dictatorship. с 30-го года. Ну, вообще много, да, да, извини. Там же все время менялись наши руководства, российское. Потом умирали уже там, ну, Ленин, Ленин помер в 24-м году, Сталин в 53-м. Потом другие там были правители, и другие формы, другие, вот такие всякие, ну, завороты, перевороты. Ну, все это я ориентировался. Я вижу, что Лукашенко все делает правильно, все получается как-то у него хорошо. И много чего он делает. Ну и я только за него и голосую. Всегда я только за него голосовал. С Россией надо держаться, чтобы, чтобы помогать друг другу и, и выручать друг друга всегда. Вот мое такое... Понимание простое, ясное. We already shown that Ukrainians are ready to die for democracy. You should choose. Uh, you fight or you lose. That's it. That's it. If you are not ready to fight, you will lose anyway. Because the idea that these guys, Putin, Lukashenko, will go out themselves, it's not a very good idea. It's a fairy tale. The most powerful lesson uh, I've learned in my life is that however strong a dictatorship, however strong the prevailing forces, however strong and powerful the repression, when enough people are willing to stand up for what's right, they succeed. And I think even in the darkest times, in the darkest days, when it 
seems to be most difficult and most uphill to climb. I think it's very important to remember that. You know, Soviet dissidents uh, had the saying that night is darkest before the dawn. And I think that is a very important lesson to remember.